Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, and hope you all can hear me. Uh, my name is Darren Newsom. I am the guest host uh, for today's uh, webinar. Uh, Michael Brown uh, is the moderator. Uh, he is with Bar Charts, and and I want to uh, I want to thank uh, my friends at Bar Chart and Michael uh, for the invitation uh, to to speak to everyone today. So uh, we're going to cover markets uh, in a hurry. Uh, we're going to talk about we're going to cover a lot of ground. But I want you to be able to ask questions. And while I won't be looking at the questions necessarily as they come in, when we get to the end, I'm going to turn this over to Michael and he'll do his part. Uh, and then I will open up the questions again. I'm going to take a look. So feel free. I really always enjoy the question part of this, of the, of these webinars. So, when we get to that time, any time as I'm talking or going over charts or going over studies, uh, looking at the various markets, feel free to uh, feel free to ask a question. I'll also remind everybody uh, that this is uh, that this is this is being recorded. It'll be played. Uh, you can you can find it at a later date as well. Uh, so, Michael, are are you there? Okay, I'm sure he is. He may just be having some technical gifts. Michael, is that you? Yeah. Can you hear me, Darren? I can hear you. Yes, I can. Okay, per okay perfect. Perfect. Sorry about that, folks. I was uh, not able to get myself off of mute, but I'm all set to go now. So, okay, very good. Well, let me just do a, a quick introduction. Uh, sorry about that delay there, but we uh, need to let more people uh, get on board with us here. Uh, so we're good to go now. Uh, so good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. This is our first quarterly uh, Market Outlook webinar uh, by Bar Chart. Uh, as Darren said, I'm Michael Brown, Head of Sales for Commodities for Bar Chart. I'm joined today by Darren Newsom, who has over 30 years of experience as a commodities market analyst with a focus on grains and oil seeds, livestock, the energy complex, metals, and softs. Today, Darren is going to give us his perspective on the market outlook for 2019. And then following Darren's presentation, I'll provide an introduction to Barchard's brand new uh, market solution called Commodity View. Now at the very end, we'll leave time uh, for questions and answers. So during the two presentations, uh, feel free to use the uh, questions dialog box within the webinar app uh, to submit questions. And we'll address as many of those as we can at the end of the session. And so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Darren uh, for his markets presentation. And take it away, Darren. All right. Thanks again, Michael. Really appreciate it. And uh, uh, again, this, uh, looking forward to this. It's always fun this time of year uh, to, to throw an outlook out there. And, and given all of the unknowns that we have, uh, you know, it's, it's truly going to be a fascinating year. Um, Starting off, many of you have known my analysis for a long time, have followed my analysis for a long time. Others may be new to the way I like to look at things. And, you know, as I, as I come to the end of the year, uh, it's, it's interesting to me. There's, there's three basic kings of commodities, and we'll get into those. Uh, these have changed over the years, over the decades, but as of now, we have three kings of commodities, three leaders of the key market sectors. And it's interesting to me how they all fit together here as 2018 comes to an end and 2019 is set to start. And what's most interesting to me is that there is a wild card out there in the commodity sector and it could steal the spotlight from these three kings. So with that in mind, let's take a look. All right, so what are the three kings of commodities? In metals, obviously, we have gold. Gold has long been viewed, you know, going back probably since the dawn of time, gold has been viewed as the market of choice, quote unquote, safe haven, uh, you know, the hedge against geopolitical problems, wars, anything you can imagine. Whenever something like that arises, the rush, at least in theory, has always been to gold. 
is that still the case? You know, we're going to take a look. What, what does gold look like right now from the market's point of view as we come out of 2018 and into 2019 in the energy market? You know, we've got the, the crazy natural gas. It'll never be king because it's more of a it's more of a court jester. Uh, it, it's insane. But the crude oil market, you know, there, particularly in the 90s, uh, with all the problems in the Middle East and Gulf Wars going on, crude oil basically supplanted gold as the geopolitical edge. And it's still viewed. Uh, and it's still rightfully viewed as one of the kings of commodities because as, as crude oil goes, so goes distillates, which is heating oil, so goes arbob. They all basically follow the lead of gold. They all have their own separate supply and demand issues, their own fundamentals that, that help to drive things. But in the end, it's still what's the direction of crude oil market. And as we've seen, uh, crude oil has been a fascinating market here the latter half of 2018 certainly looks like that's not going to change uh, heading into 19. And of course, since the early 2000s, roughly 2005, uh, when we had the Energy Policy Act of 2005, which instituted uh, the Re Renewable Fuels Program, uh, Renewable Fuel Standards, uh, CFTC changed the rules for how many contracts in agriculture, uh, agricultural commodities can be held uh, by speculative traders. Corn all of a sudden ascended to the throne uh, of the grains complex. You know, for, for decades it had been really a toss up uh, between corn and soybeans, you know, back and forth. You know, volatility was always in, uh, in soybeans, while, while volume was, always, was usually in corn, I should say. Some would argue wheat, uh, you know, with its moniker, the greatest market of them all. Wheat, though, being grown worldwide, there's never really seems to be a huge threat to the wheat supply. So with the ethanol demand that was mandated, with the increase in non-commercial investment activity, uh, corn became king. Uh, you know, we've heard the old adage, king corn, and so on. So we're going to be talking about corn. And what's interesting to me, what, what I find most interesting about corn as, as this year comes to an end is the way that we have seen corn move back into its old characteristics. Gone are the days of these wild swings. Way back when, way back before 2005, corn was always most comfortable moving sideways and then just getting a weather scare to break it out of its range. But again, what we see, what I see right now is, is just a return to the way things used to be. Some would argue, and, and I have some some good good friends in the cotton industry. Well, they say, what about cotton? You know, the cotton used to be one of the kings, and that's the key. It used to be, but recent years and decades have shown, you know, it, it just doesn't have. There's just not the market interest. You have, you know, you have the Asian demand, you have some demand from I India, but the U.S. portion of that market has decreased over time. Now we saw a little bit of a comeback last year with more acres planted uh, in the United States. It probably uh, at least that many planted again in 2019. So corn still hangs on the fringe, but it certainly, you know, it certainly could be the subject of a future webinar, depending again on acres that we see this spring. But as of now, uh, as of the last, you know, quite a few, quite a few years, we just haven't seen cotton uh, in the role of king. Softs in general have taken a back seat. You know, I'm talking about the cocos, the coffees, and and the sugars and all these have taken a back seat uh, to what's been going on in these other three market sectors. Okay, all that having been said, what are some of the underlying intermarket relationships that we see, that we deal with uh, all the time? First and foremost is rising interest rates, and rising interest rates tend to strengthen the U.S. dollar. We've seen basically since 2016, late 2016, early 2017, a series of interest rate increases by the Federal Reserve. I know they're meeting again. We could have another one coming up very soon. You know, the bets are on. Are we going to see another increase? How many increases are we going to see in 2019? Is it going to be four? Is it going to be five? Is it only going to be two? You know, the higher interest rates go, the more it strengthens the U.S. dollar. So are there signs out there that we can see, that we can, that we can analyze, 
that say whether or not the dollar thinks, I know we're supposed to be looking at, at T-bonds and, and, and T-bills and all of these things to understand uh, whether or not we're going to see interest rate increases. But to me, if we look at the dollar, what is the, what's, what's the role of the dollar? What is its position? Uh, what is it indicating about the possibility of, of interest rate increases? We're going to take a look at that. Uh, higher interest rates also, uh, and, the, and the stronger U.S. dollar, tend to weaken U.S. stocks. So as interest rates go up, uh, interest rate investments, interest rate-driven investments, tend to pull some money away from the stock market. And, you know, so the dollar's going up, interest rates are going up, first dollar's going up, we start to see the, uh, we start to see stocks begin to fall. Also this year, there's always talk about, you know, end of the year sell-off, uh, we'll see. Uh, I think there's some key things going on in the stock market besides the, uh, besides just normal patterns. Uh, I think there's some long-term indicators that are a little bit spooky for the stock market that would certainly indicate interest rates could continue to go up. Uh, and finally, the higher interest rates and the stronger dollar tend to weaken commodities, particularly gold. Gold and the dollar have a, usually have a very solid, I'm not going to say strong, I don't know the actual percent, but there's usually a, a, there's usually a solid inverse relationship between what the dollar is doing and what the gold is doing. That's not always the case. And when I look at the charts and when I show you the charts here in a little bit, what you're going to see uh, is is an oddity, at least to me, of the way that gold and the dollar are moving. So some key market relationships seem to be struggling a little bit uh, at this time. So let's look at the Dow Jones, all right? If you can look quickly, uh, if you look closely, I'm going to try to highlight this. If you look at the activity, so this is the, the far right one is the December, and then we've got the November. If you look over here at October and what we see there, we went to a new high. Went to a new high up around just short of 27,000. And we traded below the September low and closed lower for the month. Now, I'm a technical analyst by trade that uh, being, you know, in the grain industry and ag industry for most of my career have to, uh, have to also look at fundamentals. And I have a different way of looking fund at fundamentals that you'll see later. But as a technical analyst, when I see a new high followed by a low below the previous month's low and a low lower month uh, lower monthly close, that's a key reversal. And this is on the monthly charts. This is on the long term. This is the major trend. Long term trend looks to have posted a key reversal. So to me. Regardless of anything else that's going on, it looks like the stock market's getting ready to go down. Now, how far could it go? Um, I know I've got some Fibonacci numbers in there. Uh, I, I like to look at retracement numbers. Uh, but with the Dow, uh, it's also, you know, I li also like to go back and I like to look at Dow theory. Uh, and if I look at the Dow theory, 33% and so on, uh, let's see here. Uh, that would put it at uh, at about 20,000. So we could see a 33% retracement would bring it down to 20,000. Um, that's, you know, I think that's a legitimate target. Right now we're looking at, we've been looking at moving to a new low for 2018, below the 23.4, 23.3, something like that. Uh, if we take that out, I don't see why we couldn't get down to about 20, about to about 20,000. Uh, it certainly seems to make sense. And let's keep in mind, this uptrend that looks like it just came to an end uh, in October started back in March 2009, all the way back at 6,400. So we've had a decade's worth of moving up. The great thing about market sell-offs and, and, and long-term downtrends, as you can see uh, from stochastics at the bottom, is gravity, market gravity really pulls on these things and you fall so much faster than you go up. Now, I have only a very few written rules uh, about markets and one of the unwritten rules, so I call it rule number five, is that over time, 
stock markets will go up. So we'll see a retracement. We'll see this thing pull down. But what it'll do is it'll set up another long-term uptrend. And we just have to wait for it. And right now, I'm going to say most of 2019, or at least the first half of 2019, we could see, we should see stocks stay under pressure. <coughs> okay, excuse me. So what about the dollar? Here's where things start to get a little bit interesting. Uh, back in late 2017, early 2018, uh, we saw the dollar put in a low. Put in a low right around 88.20, and this is on the spot dollar. Uh, since then, and if we go down to stochastics, we also see a key uh, uh, signal that I look for, and that's a crossover below the oversold 20%. So we actually moved into a long-term uptrend at the end of 2017. And as you can see, we've spent most of 2018 going up. So much so that we are testing resistance at a Fibonacci retra uh, retracement number of 61.8%, around 97, almost 98 points. But we're stalling right here. So this would suggest, and notice that monthly stochastics have moved above 80%. This is a little bit interesting to me in the fact that this is setting up for a potential long-term top. And a long-term top in the dollar is not suggesting, certainly doesn't hint that we're going to continue to see interest rates go up. So we have a little bit of a discrepancy here. We have the stock market that looks like it wants to continue to come down, yet the dollar looks like it's getting ready to turn down. So the stocks, so, so the dollar and the stocks could be trading, could be moving in the same direction here as we go into 2019. Now, we do not have a sell signal yet like we did in the stock market, like we did in Dow Jones. But it certainly is interesting to watch here as we seem to be getting closer. We've run up against that retracement resistance, and we're starting to turn down. So we look like Dow is heading lower. The dollar could be heading lower. So as we look ahead quickly into 2019, Again, we've established, or it certainly looks like we've established a major or a long-term top uh, in, the, in the stock market, in the Dow Jones, and, and we've got a downtrend going. The also, dollar, uh, looks like it could move. We haven't yet, but it could move to a major long-term downtrend. So the question is, does this tell us, or what does this tell us about interest rates? I honestly don't know. Personally, I'm thinking interest rates are still going to go up. But if we start to see these things happening the way they're setting up right now, I'm going to say the Fed's not going to be as aggressive as what many think. I don't think we're going to see the four or five interest rate increases coming in 2019. They may back off a bit, uh, particularly as we head into another election cycle that starts here in 2019. Uh, the Fed may not want to, uh, the administration may not want the Fed to run wild raising interest rates. And so I think we could, uh, particularly if some of our economic numbers start to cool off a bit, uh, even more so than they have, I think we could see uh, the Fed take a much calmer, a much more uh, conservative approach to raising rates in 2019. Are these historic intermarket relationships broken? You know, again, we seem to be seeing things that don't normally happen, but there is a point in the cycle where all of these things tend to move together in, in the normal business cycles or, or economic cycles. So it's not particularly unusual that we have the Dow still going down, and it's moving down ahead of what we might see in the dollar. Uh, but it's still an interesting development to me. And most importantly, <clears throat> what does this mean for commodities? All right. Let's take a look at gold. Gold's just in a sideways trend right now. We can't break out. I mean, we, we've got two different sideways trends going on here. Uh, and, and by the way, these little snippets that you see, these little uh, analytical snippets, those are mine. Uh, I pulled those off. I update those every month and every week. And then uh, I just attach them to uh, the charts that I'm using from bar charts uh, so you can see what I'm looking at uh, when, when, I, when I write these things up. And what, and what gold, you know, it's, it's stuck between two different price ranges, and we're basically at the midpoint between both of those ranges. 
Uh, midpoint looks like it's right between like 12.11 and 12.47, 12.48. So we just can't move anywhere. Don't have any strong buy signals. Don't have any strong sell signals. Stochastics are staying between uh, the 20 and 80%. But if I look down here, we're actually closer. If I look at stochastics down at the bottom of the screen, we're actually closer to the oversold mark. So that would suggest we might be able to rally back up closer to the to the 80%. And if so, that would suggest that we could see gold possibly test the high end of its range of above 13,000, or excuse me, 1,300. Uh, and if so, again, if we keep in mind the traditional or the historic relationship between, the inverse relationship between gold and the dollar, that would suggest gold should go up, dollar come down, interest rates basically stay the same, stock market, Again, still thinking that it's going to fall. So I would lean towards at least a modest rally in gold at this point, but nothing that really breaks. I, I don't think we have the momentum, at least not now. Um, I, I don't see, um, you know, it, I don't see anything on the horizon that's going to break us out of these trading ranges, these sideways trends. But that's the beauty of, of uh, the, the Oval Office Twitter account is that anything could happen at any time. And that could certainly be the fuel, that could certainly be the catalyst that breaks gold out of these ranges uh, as we make our way through 2019. All right, how about crude oil? Well, as you can see, I just updated this chart last week, at the end of last week over the weekend. And here it is Tuesday, and we've already blown it apart. Crude oil is in a strong downtrend and we went we took out the uh we took out the november low here in november already november lows down there oh i believe around 49.50 we've been down to 46 47 today so next support is down around 45 and a half next retracement supports down around 45 and a half notice there was also a pocket of trade from 2017 down in that same area stochastics have collapsed with the faster moving line already below 20%, slower moving lines trying to get there. What this suggests to me is we've got some more down, down, uh, we've got some more downward momentum coming in crude oil. We don't have the support at this point. We don't have the buying interest to spark much of a rally early in December. I guess we tried to see on the weekly charts, the secondary trends, tried to see them turn up. But the fun thing is, Long-term charts trump short or intermediate-term charts, which trump short-term charts. It's just a, it's just the way it goes. So if we're in a strong enough downtrend on the on the monthly chart, it's going to be hard to get any sort of uptrend going on the weekly chart. Now seasonally, if we throw the seasonal component into this, crude oil does tend to trade down into say early February, early to mid February. About the time, you know, we're almost through winter, uh, we start to see some or some early spring buying uh, gasoline, uh, locking in some prices in gasoline, disputes as well, and that tends to bring some support back into the market. So given that, we both have time and price indicators showing us this market may have a little bit more room to the downside. All right. Now, I talked about how I'm mostly an anal uh, a technical analyst. But I do look at fundamentals. But I look at fundamentals from a technical point of view. Not only do I look at the trends of future spreads, that gives me a good idea of, of, the, of what's going on in the idea of those who are actually involved in the underlying cash commodity, but I also look at the forward curve. And here we have the crude oil forward curve, uh, which is just the different contracts all priced, all plotted on the same chart. So, Again, if I uh, look at uh, a forward curve that goes from the lower left to upper right means it's got a carry or a contango. I'm not even going to try to spell it. Carry or contango in the, in the forward curve. The, the deferred contracts are higher priced than the nearby, and it's a stair step sort of thing. The stronger that angle is from the lower left to upper right, the more bearish the fundamentals are. Everyone says, no, it says they're willing to pay you more later on. That's the wrong way to look at it. They're willing to pay you less right now. And the reason they're willing to pay you less right now is that there's plenty of supply to meet demand. So when you see a forward curve going up from the lower left to the upper right, 
and quarter. It's a bearish situation. And certainly with crude oil, uh, it's in a very consistent carry and a very consistent contango uh, heading out at least to the summer, late summer, August of 2019. Then it starts to flatten out a bit, a little bit due to the lack of interest as you get further out, uh, lack of open interest in volume and so on. So the to story is really told here in this first 12 months or so, uh, 8 to 10 months. So that's what we're looking at. That's what I like to look at in the crude oil market or in any market per se uh, is what is this, you know, and this gives us this long-term outlook. Fundamentals are still bearish. Certainly reason for the market to continue to go lower. And once we get to a point in the futures market, cash market, where the forward curve starts to flatten out a little bit, that's when we can say fundamentals are starting to change, that we've reached that price point that's going to start bringing buyers back in on the supply demand side. All right, king corn. This is this is a monthly chart of the bar chart national corn index, and I like the bar chart national corn index because it is a weighted average, and it's a very important distinction. It looks at it gets the quotes from 4,000 plus sites across the United States, the price quotes, and it's weighted by their volume. Uh, not so so a, so a thousand bushel elevator doesn't have the same weight as one that handles a million bushels. I like it. But this is what I was talking about earlier. Corn is in a sideways pattern. And that's what it likes to do. Right now, we're basically between, and this is the cash side. I like to use the cash side. It's the intrinsic value of the market. You can play a lot of games in the futures market, but the cash price is what it is. It is the intrinsic value of a market. So what we see here is that we're basically locked in a range between 405, uh, basically 405 and a half and 265 and a half, somewhere in that range. The midpoint of that is around 335 and a half. We just poked our head up to around 345, 346 uh, this month. I don't see a lot going on in here. We've got a bit of a, you know, we've just got a bit of an upswing. I think we're still going to run into soup. Let me go back a page. Uh, I think we're still going to run into some resistance uh, up around, you know, we get up into that 370, 375 area uh, that, that peaked out the, the, the early spring rally in 2018, and most likely we're going to start to see some cash sales being made. So get a little bit of an up in this market, and I think we're going to start working our way back down. A lot of it's going to depend on how strong demand stays. Right now demand is quite strong, still strong. Uh, for U.S. corn, can't say that about all the markets, but certainly is in corn. And here's another way I look at the fundamentals. So I talked about the forward curve, but in grains, oops, in grains we also have uh, we also have the ability to measure how much does it cost to hold our cash commodity in storage in the storage facility. And so by looking at each future spread and taking that as a percent of the overall cost of holding that grain in storage in commercial storage, we come up with whether or not you know the market's carry in this case uh, is bullish or bearish. And so here, you know, we're looking at the, D, uh, the March 2009 contracts so and March 2009 through say September 2009. That's the 1819 market year. So. Basically, you know, March to May is at 56 percent, 56 and a half percent full commercial carry, about 53 and a half percent full commercial carry out to the July, out to the step, about 38 and a quarter. Neutral. That's really all it is. So we've got a sideways trend going on in the cash market. We've also got a sideways trend going on in the futures market, and we've got future spreads that are neutral. Uh, we go a little further out, May to July, also relatively neutral at 50%. My way of looking at it, anything greater than 66% is bearish, anything less than 33% is bullish, anything in between is just considered neutral. So there's not a lot of reason on the cash side at this point for traders to get excited. It looks like we have a pretty level supply and demand uh, playing field at this point, just no real surprises right now. So technical view of commodities, gold in a, a long-term sideways trend, waiting for the next tweet from the Oval Office. Crude oil, the market energy complex as a whole, is in a major downtrend. 
I do not look for that to change. You can look at the RBOMS monthly. You can look at the distillates monthly. It's all about the same. And we have a solid carrier contango and crude, meaning that we've got bearish fundamentals as well. Corn, looking at the uh, cash market's sideways trend and the fact that it's uh, the cost of carry table is neutral, this thing's going nowhere fast. That's just the way corn likes it. You know, it's going to take some sort of earth-shattering news at some point somewhere uh, to break things up. Uh, questions that we have about the gold market, you know, is trade wars and action by the U.S. Fed, uh, is it going to be enough to keep traders interested in precious metals? Will gold still be viewed as a safe haven market? And as I said, it looks like it wants to go up to the upper end of its range. So I would say there's something coming along the road, either with the Federal Reserve or with uh, with trade war news or, or unrest somewhere that could give a little bit of a spark to the gold market. So much of what happens in crude oil depends on the on, on OPEC and Russia and what they decide to do. And so the only thing I can say for traders in this complex is good luck. Uh, that news, uh, those developments change all the time, and we don't see it until after the markets react to it. Not that crude oil is going to become natural gas anytime soon, but it's going to stay volatile, and it's going to stay volatile, and everyone's going to pin a you know, pin movement on the latest headline. So you know, just have to watch it closely. That's why I, 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 I like watching charts more than headlines. Uh, I, I, I can make more sense out of it. Uh, the headlines often don't make any sense at all. And as for corn, President Trump still talking about how he wants to build a wall between the U.S. and Mexico, the largest buyer uh, of U.S. corn right now. Uh, we've got good corn. Uh, we've still got good corn demand. Uh, but at the same time that we're, we continue to talk about building a wall and making Mexico pay for it or somebody pay for it, uh, Brazil is working to improve its infrastructure to northern ports, which just coincidentally would help to ship more corn into Mexico. Uh, and there's also the fact that uh, there's early chatter that the U.S. producers could plant more corn in 2019. Had some interesting conversations on Twitter about that already this week. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. Those those numbers are a long way from coming out right now. It's just all early chatter. We won't know more until this coming spring. So we've got the three kings. What's the wild card? Obviously, soybeans. Uh, soybeans is trade war with China. It's not all about soybeans, but soybeans seem to be the rook in all of this. Uh, the first one out of the foxhole, the first one out of the trench running into no man's land. So it's tough at this point. Uh, it's been tough. We have enormous supplies here domestically, and our demand just isn't good. Meanwhile, we've got early projections for another record crop in Brazil. Uh, and if the U.S. soybean market collapses, crude oil falls, you know, gold and corn eventually are going to have trouble holding off up on their own uh, if, if the rest of the commodity sectors are starting to show some pressure. A couple quick looks at, at, the, at the soybeans. Uh, basis is national average basis, which is the bar chart national soybean index minus nearby futures contract. And you can see we have strengthened a bit since harvest. Not surprising. Everyone's tucked their beans away. We had a record crop of beans. We're expected to have near record, uh, you know, record for as far back as we can go. Uh, ending stocks come to the 2018-19 market near like in next August, end of next August. So we've still seen basis improve slightly. But what does this mean on the big picture? If we compare it back to the last four years, we're still running below the lowest levels that we've seen, again, just because of supplies. We have huge supplies of beans. We're running below the, the lowest that we've seen as far as basis goes, the weakest basis that we've seen over the last four years. And a weak basis means plenty of supply slowdown in demand. And speaking of demand, uh, this, is, this is my export chart. Uh, We've got uh, right now, I'm projecting us to be about 1.2 billion bushels based on what we've seen so far this marketing year. USDA is sitting at, still sitting at 1.9 billion bushels of its export projection. So we've got a 700 million bushel difference, and we're already looking at 955 million bushels uh, ending stocks. So things can get very interesting in the soybeans before, this, uh, before 2019 is over. And so with that, I'm going to pass this back over to Michael. Uh, let me get that taken care of, and he will take you. Uh, he will take you 
There you yeah, go. I think you should have it, Michael. Thanks so much, Darren. Yes. Okay, everyone. Well, I uh, get ready to get started here. Um, if you do have any questions, again, just send those in via the uh, question panel within the webinar uh, application. And uh, at the end of this next part of the presentation, uh, we'll address those questions. Okay, very good. So uh, I'm going to just give an overview of Barchar's brand new commodity view uh, desktop solution. It's really a, a powerhouse uh, new entrance uh, to the commodity markets. It's built on modern technology, all HTML5. It's a true SaaS delivery model, software as a service. It's entirely mobile and portable. Uh, it, it really incorporates all of the workflow of an agribusiness and incorporates and integrates that into one solution. Uh, as you saw during Darren's presentation, it has very powerful charting tools and analytics. Uh, one thing that really sets it apart is the proprietary content, and we'll talk more about that. And then it's got a very flexible and intuitive uh, work, workflow management and workspace management on your desktop. So we'll go through each of these characteristics of the new product in detail. So the modern technology, uh, being HTML5, it's completely responsive. What that means is whatever you build on your desktop uh, will be viewable on your uh, iPad, on your mobile, and other devices, and in any, uh, any tablet devices. Uh, there's no download or install required. So you just simply go to a URL and log in with your credentials. No worries about uh, anything like you know, firewalls or downloading software. Uh, being HTML5 based, uh, it goes where you go. So uh, whatever you create on your desktop, uh, you travel, you're at a hotel conference center, uh, you're on your home computer, you're on your mobile device, you're on your tablet. Anywhere, any device that you log in, you're going to have access to the workspaces that you've built. Another great benefit is that uh, you have automatic updates. So whenever we push out a new release of the software, you log in the next morning and you have that release automatically. It's secure, fast, and reliable. And if you have a, a large enterprise that you're rolling this out to, it's a very, uh, being a you know, browser SaaS deliver product, very, very seamless uh, rollout to a large uh, enterprise user base. Again, it's all SaaS delivery, so it's fully managed uh, on the back end. It's delivered through Amazon Web Services. Uh, there's a continuous and secure backup, so any changes you make to your workspaces are immediately saved to our servers. You never have to worry about backing those up to a thumb, thumb drive or offsite location or any, any sort of disaster recovery uh, sort of uh, concerns are all taken care of by us. It's a very uh, scalable infrastructure. And you know going in what your costs are going to be. It's affordable and rateable uh, because the subscription cost covers all the setup, all the training, the technical support, and all of these periodic updates that we talked about. Being entirely mobile and portable is a huge benefit. The responsive design uh, gives a great user experience regardless of what device you're on, on your desktop, on your tablet, on your phone. Uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic and, and easy and intuitive uh, experience on any of those platforms. And it's available, again, wherever you are, uh, in the tractor, on an airplane, anywhere that you have internet connectivity, you've got access to quotes, news, charts, and, and your custom design workspaces. Uh, as I mentioned, it's an end-to-end -end workflow solution for agribusinesses. Uh, it's being fully integrated with grain accounting uh, software. It provides a physical uh, grain offer management system called our grain offer system, which uh, is integrated into the front end of uh, Commodity View and gives a merchandiser you know, full access to his offer book and be able to manage all offers from all, all growers. It's, it's seamlessly and tightly integrated with a futures order routing uh, and execution system. And a very unique feature is it has instant messaging. So you're able to uh, message uh, ideas, thoughts, concerns about the market, uh, et cetera, to other users of Commodity View and, and other users that are in the bar chart and, and commodity uh, ecosystem. Uh, finally, uh, the pro version of Commodity View has a, a very sophisticated uh, Excel add-in. So if there's uh, you know, daily, weekly, monthly reports, 
uh, additional analysis, uh, things that you like to do in Excel, uh, it's, it's very easy and seamless to get that, uh, you know, market data and uh, our proprietary data into Excel uh, for other analytical purposes. Uh, it has very powerful charting tools and analytics. You saw a lot of this uh, in Darren's presentation today and, and some of the tools that, that he used to do his analysis for, in preparation for this webinar. Uh, it has seasonal charts and forward curves. It has specialty calculators for the industry, such as the cost of carry calculator that you saw in Darren's analysis, uh, as well as quest calculators. Uh, you can calculate your cash bids right in a quote board. So enter, enter your basis and in real time we'll calculate the cash bid for you. Um, it, it has a grain bid lookup uh, and basis heat maps, and I'll talk more about the depth of, of that proprietary data in, in just a minute. Uh, but several different ways to, to look at those uh, cash grain bids, uh, whether it's in heat maps and historical charts uh, and, and uh, zip code lookup. And finally, uh, it supports uh, expressions. So you can build a, say, a soybean crush uh, chart, uh, just entering the expression and charting the historical uh, margins around the soybean crush, for example. And you can also do comparison charting and, and overlay various contracts on a on a single chart. And finally, uh, the single biggest differentiator between Commodity View and other products on the market is it really is jam packed with high value and proprietary content. We collect cash bid data from 4,000 locations across North America. We take this data and we've created, uh, as Darren had mentioned, uh, capacity weighted proprietary and patent pending indexes around all of that data. So you can get a, a price index or a basis index uh, at various geographic levels from county to crop reporting district in each state to a state level, uh, a regional level like uh, Western and Eastern Corn Belt, Delta, et cetera. And, and finally, at a national level. And those indexes are uh, really interesting. They're not just uh, spot or new crop indexes, but because we're, kept, we're uh, collecting cash bids for every delivery period that an elevator is bidding for, we essentially have a full a forward curve of the cash markets, which is uh, very unique and, and very valuable. We have our own, also in this, in this part, we have our own uh, industry-leading commodity news wires. Uh, so we'll have a look at that, uh, you know, in, through a trial of, of commodity news. So very in-depth in uh, news wire service. We have uh, crop and, and growing condition indexes. So we take the most critical parameters affecting crop growth uh, and create indexes, again, at various geographic levels. So you can zero in on where the crop conditions are most favorable, uh, or where the weather conditions are the most favorable to the crop, and compare those indexes year over year to see how uh, yield this year should progress uh, compared to previous years. We have uh, our commodity stats database, which you may have seen a press release on here recently. Uh, that's included in Commodity View and that covers uh, fundamental and economic data. So for example, all the USDA reports around crop condition, crop progress, uh, crop production, you know, those, those sorts of reports as well as economic uh, reports like PPI, CPI, et cetera. And then finally, of course, we have global uh, exchange coverage. Uh, so whether you're using this product uh, in, in North America or whether you're using it in, in Europe or Asia or South America, we have the global exchange coverage uh, that you require. And I mentioned earlier, uh, flexible workspace management. Uh, it's an extremely easy uh, and intuitive uh, platform to work with. Each of the panels can be linked uh, together very seamlessly so that if you click on a corn, corn uh, quote and quote board, uh, your charts, your market depth, your other displays all update around that contract that you've selected. Uh, it's very easy to share customized workspaces. So if you build out a, a workspace and you want the rest of your team to use that workspace, it's a simple uh, two, two clicks and a copy and you send them that workspace, they load it up and they're ready to go. So you can literally roll this out to a, 
you know, an enterprise user base of 50 users uh, in a matter of minutes. And then finally, you can spread your workspaces across multiple monitors, create those workspaces and, and utilize, you know, your monitor real estate as you best see fit. Okay, so that's, that's our, our new Commodity View product. Uh, it is available for trial. I'd be more than happy also to give any, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one, uh, personalized demos too. Just uh, simply shoot me an email or give me a call the the number's and email address on the screen. And uh, we need to set up with a trial and, and walk you through the product. Michael, I, I had a question. I, I had a question come in. Um, but before I answer it, I also want to say Mike Michael talked about how there's a function on the uh on the on the system where you can pull the data to an Excel and then work with it within an Excel. You saw those Excel charts that I had. That's how I did them. I, you know, Michael has taken me, take, and it just took a couple minutes. He showed me how to do it. I was able to pull the data over, work with it. You can start manipulating it however you want. You know, if you're, if you're someone like me who just loves to chart things, has to chart everything, it's a great fit because you can just immediately pull the data over, and it was uh, very handy to put it together this presentation. Now, uh, as to the question, I had one come in. It's a great question. Uh, it starts off with the bio, and if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to continue to send them in. We've got time to answer them. The biodiesel impact. Soy oil is getting extremely competitive with fats and greases that, uh, excuse me, that, uh, that used to trade at an extreme discount. There will be increased demand in soy oil from biofuel due to this. Will it move the market much? Great question. The soybean complex, the U.S. soybean complex needs something. We've had strong soybean meal demand. Our crush is outstanding this year. So we, you know, for 18, 19, we're already off to a good start as far as crush goes. So we're crushing a lot of soybeans. We're creating a lot of meal. And at the same time, we're creating a lot of soybean oil. And as Michael said, there is a soybean crush function on, on the bar charts that you can you can plug in and watch. Um, certainly plays a part in this. Right now, I don't know that soybean oil demand for bean oil on its own is going to be enough to save the soybean market because all of the all of the attention is on soybeans. But if we can continue to crush at this pace and we continue to produce both soybean meal and soybean oil, and we have the demand, and we have increased demand for soybean oil. The reason why bean oil prices are depressed down to those other fats and greases is because we have such a huge supply. Like everything else, we have a, a huge supply. But in the case of bean oil, we've got this possibility of demand through biodiesel. Now, it's been talked about for a decade at least. We may finally see enough momentum that we start to see a structural change in, in the forward curve of the soybean oil market. And if so, it could provide some support to soybeans. I just don't know. I just don't know if it's going to be enough to hold up the entire complex. So it's a great question. It's a great question. Michael, did you have any questions connected? Uh, yes, I did have one. Uh, and the question was, are there different versions of Commodity View available? Um, and there are. There is a Commodity View Lite and a Commodity View Pro. Uh, we do not have a ton of different a la carte uh, items. We, we like to package things up and make it a, you know, a obvious known price going in. So the Commodity View Lite uh, has quotes, news, charts, the analytics that you saw. The Commodity View Pro uh, adds in both functionality and deeper content. So in the Pro version, uh, you get the you know specialty calculators like the crush calculators and the cost of carry calculators some specialty charting tools uh, like the seasonal charts and forward curves. And a real big adder uh, is some of the proprietary data that uh, I talked about, the, the cash bid data from 4,000 locations, uh, the very uh, unique proprietary uh, indexes, you know, capacity weighted indexes that we talked about uh, at the various geographic levels. So the, you know, the, the two versions are you know, well suited for two different uh, types of users. Uh, and the pro pro version uh, really is a, a state of the art uh, content packed uh, tool. Okay. 
Okay, Michael, uh, any other any other questions for you? Uh, yes, there is uh, one more that came through here. Uh, it says, how does the chart system compare to DTN's ProfitX? As I understand, the ProfitX is 15 to 20 years old, so is the chart system more advanced? Please explain. Uh, very good question and very good observation. Um, not And really not only just around the, the charting system, but around the platform in general. Uh, as I had mentioned, the, the Commodity View platform is brand new. It's new technology. Uh, it's well suited for the desktop. There's no download required. There's no firewall issues. Um, there's you know no no need to worry about updates. We take care of all of that, um, and all of those kinds of things are, are the benefit of the technology. Um, another area is is uh, the the mobile responsiveness of the technology, so that you can use it on your phone, on your tablet, etc. And all of the tools that we build. Uh, for the desktop, roll right over to those other platforms. So it's, you know, yes, the the charting is more advanced, and I think you saw, you know, a lot of tools uh, today that uh, Darren used in his presentation uh, that that really take advantage of the charting uh, technical analysis and, and other tools that are available. But again, it's not just the charting area; it's it's the entire platform that is is really modern. And, you know, unique and, re and really built for for today's uh, today's world of commodity trading and analysis. Michael, I see another great question for you. Um, the four thousand cash bids that you get, do you have a map of where those are located throughout the U.S.? Yes, we sure do. Uh, that came in from uh, Randy. Uh, Randy, if you want to give me a call afterwards, uh, I can send you a, a copy of that map. Uh, where we can do a, a quick one on one demo and I can show you the, the locations as well. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's very, you know, very, very well concentrated uh, where you would expect it to be in the main growing regions, uh, but it is national coverage as well. So we'll be more than happy to walk you through that. Okay, and there's one more. Uh, how is Commodity View, how is Commodity Light? different from Bar Chart Trader. So Bar Chart Trader uh, is, is our, well, I'll say, legacy uh, product. Um, it, you know, it is, that is a downloadable product. Uh, features and functionality-wide, it's a, a very, very strong product and on par uh, with Commodity View Lite. Um, it's really when you get into the Commodity View Pro where you start to see um, the, the specialty tools, uh, calculators, and content that we've built into that platform really heavily focused on, on commodities uh, and currently uh, ag in particular. Uh, so that's, you know, that's the primary differences, uh, both very, very strong products. Uh, are there plans to add a trading front end system? Uh, yes, in, in fact, Commodity View uh, already has uh, trade execution built in. Uh, through you know your choice of about 60 or 70 different uh, FCMs, uh, so it's we, we utilize the uh, CPG order routing system and, and risk management uh, system, uh, and so we you know we're automatically partnered with a, a vast majority of the FCM out there. Okay, very good, uh, Darren. Do you have anything else? Here? Michael, I see that you have one more that just came in. Uh, area, yield, and production. What international sources are offered? Do you have any international sources for those areas or, that are, or where that data comes from? Yes, we're, we're continually adding uh, new sources of data, and certainly our international coverage will continue to expand. Um, on a, from a production standpoint, um, it's certainly an area that we need to, you know, continue beefing up in the product. From a uh, global uh, cash price uh, perspective, we are right now in the process of adding prices at all major ports for all major uh, commodities, uh, grains, stocks, uh, feed, meal, uh, at all the major ports, uh, FOB and set prices uh, around the world. So that will be coming soon. That's going to be an, an exciting addition, to say the least. Very good. Okay, I think that wraps us up for today, folks. Very much appreciate uh, your attendance. And again, uh, uh, this uh, webinar will be available uh, 
recorded uh, after the event here. We'll, we'll make that available on our website. And anybody that would like to have either a demo or a trial or both of Commodity View, please contact me and we'll get you all set up. Thank you very much and have a fantastic day.